Hi. 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 <laughs> so, is that well, how we started? Uh, no, usually, <laughs> you know, I say something like, uh, this is on .NET. Okay. I'm your, I'm your host, Bertrand Leroy. Uh, Rich is here with me. Uh, and today we have Meichin and Yan. Hi. 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 Uh, and today we're going to talk about CoreRT and .NET Native. Yes. So what is it? Why? <laughs> where do people use it? What is it for? You mean where people? Uh, what people? Uh, where we are using Dana Native yeah. and what is it for? Yeah. Uh, today, Dana Native has shipped with UWP. Uh, is this a microphone fine? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it sounds good. <laughs> with uh, UWP scenarios yeah. and it's tied to WinRT. And I think Yang can talk a little, uh, a little bit more about CoreRT. That is where we take Dana Native to the next step. We should probably just clarify what UWP even is. Universal Window Platform, correct? Yeah, and so <laughs> and, and what what kind what what are those kind of apps? Like mm, it's a store apps in the Windows 10, okay. and pretty much depends on the WinRT stuff, like you know the XAML stack, everything kind of tied to Windows. Okay, Windows 10. Yes. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and before we go down into the technical stuff, mm -hmm. what does that what does UWP have to do with like .NET Framework and .NET Core? Like how does it how does it fit in? Uh, .NET Framework. Are you referring to a desktop yeah. or are you doing uh, well, you referring to the .NET Core? Well, um, it actually has a different profile. That that kind of window has a uh, certain ideas about the surface uh, that we can see from the framework, right? Has a little bit uh, smaller surface. I think it's closer to Windows 8 profiler API. Profile, how do you call it? Uh, profile. Uh, yeah, we yeah. yeah Windows 8 profile. I'm not sure yeah. that everyone on the call would or on the show would understand what that is. Mm. We take away some of the functionalities. For example, you do not have app domain. For example, you do not have reflection emit. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's kind yeah. of like uh, intended to be sort of a, a Smolder, modern set of APIs. Modern and more secure, and some of the legacy stuff that we do not wish to carry forward at that right. time. Yes. So that's what we did. In, that's what we did in Windows 8. That's right. Uh, and I think we we changed our our plan a little bit as we as we. You mean hit. post Windows 10? Well, a little bit in Windows 10. We, you know, like I think one of the things people complained about was um, rightfully. Was like we we only had generic collections and none of, none of the non generic ones, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I mm -hmm. think we pulled those in and the Windows yes. 10. Yes, yes, we did. So yeah. we're kind of on the path Richard. to yeah. uh, changing to it. To reach the you know the service, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, my main point was just making it clear what the scope of UWP is, mm -hmm. just, just for Absolutely. people who are yeah. familiar with that. Yeah. So it's for Windows Store apps. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Then we probably should go to yeah. Yang and talk about right. what's the next step for the .NET Native. Um, yeah, before we start talking about what's the next step, it might be uh, worth talking about like what the history of the project is because it's always totally. kind of interesting uh, topic. So um, the you know the start of the .NET Native, uh, the .NET Native really started sometime in like 2006 or 2007 when. Um, a uh, small group of people start looking at, hey, you know, like we have this like .NET framework, but it's, that's really big. You know, it has like a lot of things together, uh, but um, and a lot of features kind of packaged together. So um, that group of people started looking at what would it take to build like minimal runtime for C# -sharp language. You know, like what's the minimal possible um, possible thing that you can build uh, and still write code in C-sharp. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think we're at the very first part, part yeah. we actually called the project Native C-sharp. Uh, yeah, there are different names for it. Like uh, the, the name I think that was used for the longest time uh, was Red Hawk. The, the project, okay, the project yes. name was Red Hawk. Uh, you can actually see it in like number of places in the code base if you just search for Red Hawk. You See, see it like mentioned in Corsilla comments and you know Corati um, comments. And <laughs> right. Yeah, it's no secret. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that you actually the, the the minimal runtime can be really very minimal. It's basically just a GC with uh, that's the garbage collector with just a couple of you know assembly helpers. Um, and and uh, what are what are assembly helpers? Uh, assembly helpers are kind of the low level routines that you write to interact with the, kind of the low level the low level things. 
um, and you know. what are what are low level things? Uh, like you know for example you know like there, there are these like uh, super uh, there are these operations that need to be like super fast so you kind of want to squeeze last instructions out of them so you kind of don't want to write them in C++ you want to write them in uh, uh, assembly in assembly code. Right, so, so this this use of assembly isn't like .NET yeah. assemblies. Yeah. You're talking more about like assembler. Yeah, yeah, assem as like the machine code. Yes. Yeah. And so what's uh, what's one or two examples of one of those operations that you want to be uh, crazy, crazy uh, fast? Like the best example is write barrier because of the, uh, what we have in uh, our runtimes is generational GC and uh, what generational GC needs uh, in order to, to work it needs to know when uh, things are modified uh, on the GC heap. So when you are assigning, you know, string to a field on an object, it's not just a simple assignment. There is some bookkeeping um, to do. Um, and because of assignments of assignments happen a lot, you know, we kind of want to make sure that uh, the it's like super super lean, super fast, mm -hmm. right? So with that, like. Um you know, you said the, the one of the clear, clear goals is that it has to be super fast. So do you have a group of people that sometimes sit down and look at these assembly helpers and say like, oh, you know, this is kind of like six lines of assembly. I feel like if we kind of thought about this a different way, we get it down to like five or four. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and does that actually happen? Like you guys have been able to reduce this, uh, the number of instructions? Uh, right, it, it's actually, if you look at the right way, is how they, you know, like, if you, uh, I, I think the, if you go all the way to .NET Framework 1.0, you know, the right was, I don't know how many instructions, but we did shave, like, instruction here and there since then, so. Mm. Um, so these, like, um, a lot of these things are basically data-driven. People look at the profiles and then say, yeah, hey, we are spending like 5% of the time here, so maybe we can, you know, squeeze a little bit of it, you know. And, okay, uh, sounds good. I think we covered that topic now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think there are also a lot of uh, a lot of names that are that are going to fly around in this uh -huh. conversation. That would be uh, interesting to uh, yes. not only define but explain what the difference are. Like, for example, what's the difference between uh, what what you're doing with native and what was done earlier with Ngen? Uh, mm -hmm. What's CIL? What's uh, LLIC? All those things. What can can, we, can you uh, define some of the some of the, the terms that that well, are and, and also to? how it compares to what we did with um, Windows Phone? We talked about compiler in the cloud with um, this thing called Triton. Mm -hmm. How does the, how do how do all these things fit together? Oh my gosh! I think no, you just asked a question, question that would be about three hours, right? Okay, <laughs> so you minutes. don't have three yeah. hours. <laughs> three <laughs> minutes sounds three good minutes. for for that for that answer. Um, so how where do we you? start? Yeah. So let's think about where we start, right? I think you asked a bunch of different questions. Yes. I mean that that's yeah. trying to finish what Yang was saying. Yang was saying that uh, when we started down they needed even before down they needed this Red Hawk. And that was actually target for like a low level, like system programmer. Actually, it was a driver uh, developer that was uh, adopt to it. So we actually trim back a lot of language on the C sharp. It's actually a very small subset of C sharp. That kind of proved the concept that C sharp can be very fast as long as we do the right thing. And that's why we move on to down and native and to the opportunity because for us, adoption and also compatibility is always the hardest one. With Windows 10 store, we actually have a more closed ecosystem that we can intercept problems and also diagnose the problem early. And that's why we choose to kind of realize the done and native in the UWP scenario. And then we move on to the core RT that Young was on the track to talk about it, that we actually do open source and try to bring it to cross-plat and also light up in the non-UWP scenario as well. And then Bertrand move on to another set of questions. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> You should be. Well, did you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you cover, did you cover engine? Not yet. Okay, That's why I was going to now okay. switch um, to okay. engine. <laughs> or maybe, awesome. uh, Jan, do you want to start from the engine? Uh, you know, so, you know, in the kind of early days of .NET, we only had the JIT, right? And, and, what, and what, remind uh, us what that is. Uh, JIT is basically like a, a compiler that runs, that translates the, the, 
the IL code. That's basically what the C# -sharp compiler is producing, and that conversion from the IL code to uh, to um, basically the machine instructions that actually get executed happens at runtime, right? Basically, when you run your app, so that works great. But as you create bigger and bigger applications and bigger and bigger frameworks. Uh, the startup of the applications take a while. Uh, so, and when you look at the profiles, you see that you know ninety percent of that time is spent cheating. Um, so, this actually became a problem way back even before we shipped like .NET Framework uh, 1.0 in like two thousand one. People did realize that this is a problem. So, uh, what we built at the time was. Uh, uh, tool called engine and that basically allowed us the, the engine tool runs the 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 conversion step from IL to machine code like upfront uh, uh, and then when your application actually runs you know it just uses the cached result um, so it worked kind of it served us well for a while with the in in the full .NET framework, we kind of kept improving it. You know, we built like this uh, 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 engine service that basically maintained this cache of um, uh, engine images uh, in the background. Um, but you know, it also had like number of problems. Right when uh, when something is changes on on your machine, like when um, the let's say you get new version of the .NET framework, uh, you have to regenerate all these engine images that you generated before. And you know, if you have like a lot of things installed on your machine, it takes a while. Um, right, because they're, so, they're kind of fragile to their yeah, environment yeah, yeah. Or, or very dependent on a specific yeah, yeah. environment. Um, um, so, and it also the, the the reason why engine service work because of the the, the the .NET framework was like global thing on the machine. It's basically took over the machine. You had to be admin to install it, so you kind of own the environment, right? But but as we move to kind of the new uh, new kind of uh, uh, scenarios like you know uh, devices, uh, phones, um, the lockdowns. Uh, the lockdown um, devices like Xbox, uh, it's no, it's no longer possible to do this mm -hmm. for variety of reasons. One might be that the device might not be powerful enough, uh, or it, the policies on the device might be prohibiting it. Right? Uh, for example, on on Xbox, all code has to be signed, so you cannot just generate code on the fly. Right. Right. Um, um, so that's why we started looking into like this ahead of time compilation where you basically just like compile, uh, compile, compile some of it like not on the device, but you know, somewhere else, uh, either in cloud or when the application is developed. Right? Um, so the first iteration of this was the, was, uh, the project called Titan. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Right. That that's basically when we moved some of the compilation to to cloud, and uh, that's what we have used on phone, uh, on Windows Phone, and um, uh, you know it made things better, but it still didn't. It, it wasn't perfect, and right. uh, so you, you, you know it. You still uh, it. Uh, Basically, the, the, the way pr the Triton worked, it moved part of the compilation to cloud, and but there was still a step required on the device. Right. The way I kind of think about yeah. Triton is, uh, and these numbers are made up, but uh, it's kind of like seven eighths of the mm -hmm. compilation and computation are in the cloud. So, from a you know user experience, the amount of time that they have to wait on the device, it's much much smaller. Um, the amount that the device has to be powerful yeah. is much, much smaller, mm -hmm. but you still have the code signing problem yeah. that you mentioned because you still have an image that's uh, like an executable image that's fundamentally being yeah. created 
mm-hmm. on the, the the consumer machine. Yeah. And so it's still bad from that perspective. Mm-hmm. And that's effectively, I would almost say like, from a last mile perspective, mm-hmm. that's the problem we were trying to solve with .NET Native is, yeah. is that piece. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to point it out that uh, on the Windows 8 or the Phone 8 timeframe is actually a very big learning process for us. There's a lot of constraint that show up that was not imposed on us before. For example, signing, code integrity, oh, yeah. how safe it is, and battery life. And because uh, as Yang pointed out, long time ago, well, not long time ago, today we still have an engine, right? Engine is pretty much just, you know, priming all the DLLs for you. It does take time. And when it takes time, we take CPU time, you drain the battery. And so we were trying to be very smart on where we hide the engine time, like at 2 a.m. or maybe some idle time. And it was fine until phone comes along. I'm 32, and a battery lifetime, certainly everything is an issue, right? So how do you reduce the battery draining? When is a good time to do that? And also with ARM32, it's a less powerful chip in a way. So I think the reason that the uh, phone 8 was using Triton, but Windows 8 did not use Triton, is actually architecture also plays a, a kind of a decision point. With ARM32, when we're trying to port just 32 to ARM32, we realize that we are 4x slower than what we expected. So when you kind of, we have a profile, uh, performance team, when you do some sort of uh, projection about how long it will take and how much battery will drain and how many apps that you need to recompile when firmware got updated, we quickly realize engine is not a solution for mobile devices. Right, you were basically able to tell that from a back of the napkin type exercise yes. and realize you need to build a exactly. different product. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so... Um, but we did not have time to go all the way to native because uh, we have, were actually sitting on uh, Triton technology before we w- re- uh, figure out a place that we can realize for two years. But we are not close enough to kind of push out to all the way and to like a done native solution. And that is why, you know, Triton was a more of a, the best solution that we have a lot of time that need to be delivered in time. Sure. Yeah. So maybe we should switch back to .NET Native. Um, I think what would be useful is to understand, like, is .NET Native just one thing, or are there kind of separate parts that you can kind of talk about? This is a little bit back to um, Bertrand's question on, like, where ILC fits, for example. You know, from a, a developer standpoint, what are the parts that actually get used from, you know, they're in Visual Studio, mm-hmm. they press, like, F5 or yes. build, and eventually they're running an app. What mm-hmm. are the different components that get pulled in? Yang, you want to try that? Um, I so the, 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 the product, right? It's composed of the. Um, uh, it has basically like special version of the framework that was like refactored and you know um, uh, uh, redesigned in places to make it smaller and to make it uh, friendly for the full precompilation. Uh, for example, you know some parts of the framework emit code at runtime and then you know mm-hmm. use JIT to compile it. So if you are doing full precompilation that doesn't work anymore, you kind of need to have alternative way right. strategy is to do that. Right? Is that like um, APIs that as part of their implementation use ref emit? Yeah. Would that yeah. be one of the yeah, cases? Yeah, that's, that's a good example. Right? Yeah, okay. Um, um, the, so so this framework, then there is the, the um, compiler that basically takes the um, takes the IL and produces machine code like ahead of time. For .NET Native, for UWP, we are using a version of the optimizer from the uh, C++ backend. Uh, that is it, it's kind of same kind of optimizer as uh, uh, what the C++ compiler has. Uh, and do you get a bunch of the same benefits, or? Uh, yeah, it's kind of you know it's it's kind of this like heavy duty uh, optimizer that was tuned um, for a long time, you know, uh, for C plus plus. But you know, the op- the, there there are a few specific there are some specific optimizations that are for C sharp, but a lot of the optimizations that you get for C plus plus apply to C sharp as well, right? Um, nice. Uh, you know the one of the good ones are, for example, auto-vectorization, right? I that love that optimization, yeah. yes. 
um, that's basically like what auto vectorization does it it's it looks at uh, the the loops in your program and you know looks at the patterns that the loops uh, uh, loops uh, the, the code patterns in the code and see whether there are like these like super parallel instructions that you know modern C processors have uh, that can be used to execute that code right Think about uh, it. Developer today had to write SIMD, use our SIMD libraries, right? Mm -hmm. Think about if you don't have to use specify that use, you know, explicitly use SIMD, and then optimization right. just happen for you. Right. Yeah. Of course, you know, like these optimizations cool, right? take time, so they Absolutely. are like not as good candidates for like JIT environment. Right. Totally um, not. Yeah. Um, right. So there's the the uh, optimizer, and then the uh, uh, there is like the component that is specific to dealing with WinRT specifics um, to generate basically the interop or the bindings with uh, the WinRT API so that you can use them in C Sharp seamlessly. Um, is that kind of similar to the bindings that Xamarin has with iOS? Yeah, it, it's and like from 10,000 feet of view, it's similar, but you know, the technology, the details are different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's um, certainly uh, satisfying the same scenario mm -hmm, and requirement. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Vinati is like, in a sense, it's like Windows specific uh, uh, kind of uh, OS. It's basically a way how Windows are exposing all the new APIs. So it's equivalent to, you know, the Android Java APIs on Android and mm -hmm. or the OS X, uh, oh, the Objective C APIs on um, on uh, iPhones. And yeah, that, right. So, did you just describe what ILC is by those uh, couple things? Uh, I, I'm kind of describing what the .NET native product contains. Yeah, right. Like what's in the box when you kind of click. Uh, okay. Or, uh, click on the checkbox. Uh, install .NET native. This is these are the parts mm -hmm. that that you are getting. Right. Yeah. Um, you, I usually think about that uh, because we don't have JIT. So a lot of things that we depend on JIT to do at runtime, we have to do it AOT, mm -hmm. uh, ahead of time, mm -hmm. compiler. Yeah. And such as like reflection, mm -hmm. right? Some of the reflection services that yeah. we had to do in the, uh, the whole program analysis, trying to predict what kind of reflection data we need to support, or like inv invocation target, delegates. They actually, all those transform is kind of, and calculation of the target is happening in ILC. And that's why ILC took a long time, because first of all, you had to do a whole program analysis, trying to figure out all the support services that you need, interrupt, reflection, or generic instantiation. And then the, there's a backend pipe in UTC that does a whole program uh, optimization for you. And so I think that's probably pretty much under the hood of what is happening in ILC. Okay, right. so we just had a couple yeah. of terms there, term explosion. Yes, totally. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. ILC, that thing we keep on talking about, I think that stands for just IL compiler. So uh, correct. Yeah, so yes. that's just, just a yes. simple name. You said UTC. That's oh, just yeah. kind of a Universal different name. Universal Tuple Compiler. Yeah, that's, yeah, right? that, that's UTC yeah. is basically the name of the, name the, of the, the C++ optimizer backend. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, that we got that one covered. And then another one that I think um, a bunch of people won't get is generic instantiation. T oh. Tell me what those are. How will you describe it? Um, yeah, <laughs> so in in, in generics, uh, or you know, the, the, a lot of, kind of the modern languages have this like concept of generics. You know, in C plus plus, it, it's templates. Uh, but what those things translate into when they are compiled into machine code, they basically like are stamping the code or variants of the code, right? Uh, but the trap that is easy to get into is that. You are, you write a program, and it's a pretty simple program. But suddenly, that thing needs like many, or potentially even an infinite number of these like stamps of code. Right. right. It's it's list of string versus list of int. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, the that one is easy. The, that one is like not that bad, right? You kind of have like one copy of the code for list of string, another one for list of int. Or right? list of 
yeah. dictionary of um, int the, string and list of dictionary yeah, of yeah, string Yeah, exactly. Ints That's where it becomes more interesting, yeah. right? Um, yeah, the way I kind of think about generic instantiations is when I'm looking at documentation on MSDN, mm -hmm. I see list of T, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. the T is unspecified because yeah. it's basically saying it can be anything. So that's that's an open, that's currently an open type. Yeah. It's open to being filled. Mm -hmm. And then when you actually use it in your code, when you have like a list of dictionary of int string, then that's a, that generic has been closed. And that's to me, it's it. That's not exactly the instantiation I, I because know, that's why I was thinking about in my head. I mean, so many years David trying to educate me about generic instantiation in my head. I think kind of thinking about it two two ways. One is actually more of the E class, like kind of class representation, like a list of in, for example, what what kind of you know interface it has, the field layout, the data structure, the you know runtime representation. The other one is your piece of code when you want to execute on it, right? So I think specified type must exist for you to execute. Yeah, However, is, that, is that kind code, of like calling new almost? Yeah, kind of. Just thinking about the thing that you're backing the new, right? Yeah. And then in terms of execute the code, backing the execution, some of them you can generate more of a slow version of it and everybody can share. And then you can also have more uh, specific code gen that you can actually keep giving for optimization. For example, your list of T. If T is an arbitrary class or like a big value type, or like a, if it's just a, you know, int, then the code gen for it could be very different because for example, int, you probably can register it in code gen, right? But not arbitrary size or value type. So I always think about, there, there could be code sharing, but not as optimized. There could be more copy of code for the same I.O. that you write, that is more optimized. However, every single instantiation that you run, it must have a specific runtime data structure representing it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So okay. So you talked about the tooling or the the tool chain. Mm -hmm. So there must be a runtime still. Yes. Where does that fit in? Yeah. There's <laughs> like the the the, the basically like evolution of the .NET Red Hook runtime. That's basically the framework sits on top of you know. Um, um, and you know the last part that we didn't talk about that is like that you know there's like Debugger, debugger build system so that you can actually press F5 in Visual Studio and it gets built and you know hit your breakpoint and so on, right? And so if you go through that whole process and you write hello world, what's kind of the size of the most minimal .NET native app today? Um, Single file is what six megabyte. Yeah, it's it's like in the order of megabytes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. we, we don't, you know the. If, if you are talking about the Vinati Hello World apps, right, they are kind of not just doing Hello World console right line Hello World, they kind of that's you know, correct, yeah. have a bunch of the you know UI parts in it. Mm. Yeah, that, that's I think it's like around five megabytes. Mm. Yeah, so that's like Hello World XAML. Yeah. Yes, because uh, Vinati use a lot of generic, and for a ahead of time compiler, there are certain areas are really, really hard to deal with. Reflection certainly is a, a place, and the other one is actually the generic. And Winati, unfortunately, use a lot of generic and also the projection. So the size blow and getting the size under control was actually pretty tough problem. Yep. Sounds like it. It is. Mm -hmm. Just trust us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what about um, pruning the, the, the tree of code that you need to have in the in the executable once mm -hmm. you've once you've compiled are you are you doing anything with that similar to what the Xamarin linker is doing uh, wh where where is that mm -hmm. uh, headed totally um, yeah but like <laughs> you know <laughs> to, to get the to get the get the reasonable size we do have uh, uh, we, we do this kind of uh, uh, pruning um, uh, so it, it's kind of similar technology to what the what Zamarin has, uh, uh, and we are actually like in active discussions with, with with them right now whether we can kind of merge it or start sharing it. You know. Um, so does a developer, yeah. if I'm writing an app, do I have to be kind of cognizant of um, whether my app is friendly to be um, pruned and made smaller by the tooling? Like, do I get any? Um, feedback back to say like uh, I tried to prune your app but I couldn't because of the way you wrote it. 
uh, you kind of don't have that kind of feedback that tells you, hey, you know, you, you, if you cannot prune it, we basically just don't prune it and you see like big EXE at the end, um, right? So um, that, um, that may be something we can do better at like telling people, hey, you know, if you write these five lines differently, your EXE will be five megabytes smaller. Mm. <laughs> we actually have been spending a lot of time yeah. trying to tune our whole program's analysis to be more aware about certain code patterns that could cause explosion. And in addition to that, we also have implemented a bunch of the technology and trying to shrink down the uh, explosion as well. Uh, if I look back, I mean, Young and I have been working on Dana Native for like a past four years. Okay, so whole program analysis, I think we built it three times. Mm. The first time you build it, uh, pretty much the size just explode. We couldn't even finish compilation. And I remember one of the developers came to me and said, can we switch ILC to 64-bit? So you wouldn't run out of it. <laughs> yes, reach back, go sign. <laughs> and my answer is, no, go fix your problem. <laughs> then they build another <laughs> one, right? Once it, the size is controlled, we finally managed to compile it, and then we're trying to stand up some of the applications. You know what? It took us three weeks to stand up one store application. And then you know the logic that you build in was not quite right. So that's why I say, you know, the whole program analysis is actually a very complex problem. There's a lot of things that you do in reflection or even c sharp dynamic keyword. What's the semantics of it? What expect to be capped, right? Those are extremely hard. And there are certain, uh, certain patterns that are extremely difficult for keep the size small, for example, entity framework. If you look at the, we shipped the Dana Native last year in June, when I say last year it was 2015. The, the size explosion happened in general, uh, generic virtual method, GVM. Now I'm mm -hmm. not doing the terminology <laughs> without explaining it, right? Yeah. That one actually explodes. And then also reflection does not just work. You really have to be very careful with us about your reflection pattern. There are certain reflection API make AOT extremely hard, like make generic method, make generic type. And sometimes that type name is actually a string somewhere you receive later right. that you don't even know, right? So th those things actually, it's not general reflection make it hard, but they are enough, like, you know, just a handful of API make it really hard. Edge cases. Yes, edge cases. Unfortunately, yeah. those edge cases was used in many places that we built in our framework, like a C-sharp yeah. runtime, right? So, so we believe that we are actually on a path that we can cover most of those uh, kind of explosion cases, like uh, GVM, we already taken care of that. Reflection, we take care of that. Recursive generic also caused explosion. Yes, Richard, let's sign about that one. Mm -hmm. I think there was one point we talked about, should we just decide like, you know, the depth of the, the instantiation is just fixed, right? And what if you pass that, what do we do? But I think now we have a solution for that. And then now we are actually working on a solution for WinRT to trim down the size. So uh, I think in general, technology was heading into the right direction. We do, cool. it's a complex problem. We need a bit of time. Yeah. Go ahead. So are all those problems uh, the, the, the basic reason why the native switch on the .NET Core CLI uh, was... You mean talk about a debug and release build using a different runtime? No, 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 no I, I'm yeah. talking about, uh, so yeah. on, on there were some pre-release versions of, of yeah. uh, .NET Core where mm -hmm. the, the dash native uh, flag was on the yeah. was available and uh, yes. it was removed. Mm -hmm. uh, are all those unfinished things uh, part but of the reason that for, for for not which was uh, right, basically like right. when we when we initially started to do the .NET CLI tooling, right, yes. we kind of didn't know exactly what what is it. We kind of you know run fast, and so we said, okay, we have this native compilation. Let's try to add the native compilation support to it as well. And you know, as we uh, are heading with kind of you know productizing it with like release version we have kind of trimmed uh, the things that are like not fully baked yet mm -hmm. um, you know like I, I do expect that we uh, we we will add this back as you know as the we, we mature the karate and you know like the as the as the dotnet native or the dotnet native karate becomes 
available for the console apps. Yeah. Uh, you Remember, know. we don't support console app yet, yeah. and we don't support Linux yet. Yeah. So <laughs> Thunder Core is actually more broader in terms of like way it supports. That yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I'm asking because I've, I've, yes. I've I, I got the question several times. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. When, no, you when the when, yeah. when the native switch yeah. would, would come <laughs> back? Uh, um. Well, you know, a lot, lot of it, uh, yeah, a lot of it was actually, you know, like also had to do with the conversion to MS built because of all that plumbing, uh, uh, you know, needs to be redone, right? So right. we do actually have in the Korati repo, if you look, there's like MS built targets file that's kind of set up so that, you know, once the MS built uh, kind of is, uh, MS built integration is like ready, then we can we should be able to just, you know, adjust it and, you know, plug it into um, what what's it, what will be in there. That makes sense. So do you think, though, that we are going to get, um, right, so there's this core RT project. Mm -hmm. It's on GitHub. I think it's github.com slash dot net slash core RT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's out there. Um, so I guess, yeah, I was going to ask a different question, but... Um, is that like the new .NET native? Like, how should I think about that? Is that the cross-plat .NET native? What what does that represent? That re repository. Um, it's basically the parts of .NET native that we uh, that we have op open sourced. Uh, so what you will find in there uh, is the pretty much the whole framework uh, is open sourced for Korati. The core runtime, the Red Hook runtime, uh, is open sourced. Uh, we are using Ryujit uh, as the compiler, um, or as the you know IL2 native code translation, uh, translation for the native code IL2 native code translation step today. Um, my reason is that so we kind of want to have open source solution for that and cross-platform solution for that, and you know Ryujit is the only one that fits that bill today. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so that's what the Karate repo is. Uh, right, but will it, um, um, at some point, kind of back to Bertrand's uh -huh. question, you know, when the, the native switch comes back, uh -huh. um, you know, uh, will it be the core T repository that's kind of providing that? Mm -hmm. And also you said that uh, what's there is the parts that we have open sourced. Mm -hmm. When we get to this point and we've kind of productized it, will everything be there? Will it be complete with respect to what you're using, or will there be s some stuff still missing? Uh, yeah, I, I think we will have there like something that's like complete solution, right? Okay. Uh, uh, whether you know the optimizer that we use for the UW up the apps on Windows today, but what yeah, I wasn't going. To I wasn't talking about that. Yeah. I just meant from the yeah. perspective of um, if I want to build a console app with. That I'm thinking of from a .NET Core perspective, yeah, yes. a console app that I can run on Linux, Mac, and Windows. Yeah. So will there all will those be, things be there? Yeah. Yeah. We we actually a lot of the technology that's used in the Korati isn't actually in the Korati, right? We use GC and exact same GC as uh, in Core CLR, right? We oh, use Ryuji cool. that's mm -hmm. actually in Core CLR. Yes. Uh, we use the oh, CoreFX framework that. Like you know, well, the, the Korati repo only contains the low-level framework. Most of the framework code is actually in CoreFX repo. So, the 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 cor what's in the Korati repo is kind of this like sort of low level, the lower level of the runtimes. You know, kind of some kind of glue code. You know, to stitch everything together. Um, so, it's only the parts that need to be different. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Exa exactly. Okay, makes sense. Uh, I have another question then, which is, uh, you know, I, I heard this whole discussion about like, oh, you know, on some devices, you know, you didn't say this, but iOS comes to mind. Uh, you did say Xbox and also Windows Store, like by policy, um, uh, it has to, you have to have um, ahead of time, like 100% ahead of time compiled app. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. but. You know, the, my app doesn't run in those kind of environments. You know, it either runs on Windows desktop or on the Linux server. And so, you know, it sounds like AOT has some benefits, but I don't know why 
I would necessarily want um, to go all the way. Like, is there a solution that says like, oh, here are the places where AOT provides awesome benefits, but it also has a JIT, and so you have the JIT benefits. Is there some kind of hybrid solution that would actually be better for places where you're not so policy constrained? Uh, that's basically what we have in Corsia today, right? In Corsia today, you can use cross-gen to, to pre-compile stuff. And, you know, there's still JIT at runtime that, the, that you kind of can fall back to for the things that didn't get pre-compiled, right? So, uh, Okay, so then if, it, we ha- if we have a solution that roughly meets those requirements today, um, when we get the, the native switch back, what is CoreRT going to give above and beyond what CoreCLR plus, plus CrossGen provide today? Um, you know, if you have, like, I, I think the unique kind of spot for uh, CoreRT will be kind of the minimal size. Right? So if you are falling back to JIT, that still has, like, you, you have to carry a lot of stuff with you, right? So if you just want the minimal kind of Docker container with just your app, right? Um, um, having a JIT for it, if you can just like precompile everything and your app doesn't have like those bad cases of generic explosion and mm. those right. things, right? You will kind of get the best you the, can get. The deployment right? is much easier because all your dependency was compiled in, oh. right? So. So then you can think about two folds of benefit. You know, asking about what you know, what does that give to us? One is actually its deployment, and the other one is actually performance, the startup. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'm hearing like, if I, for my workload, if I'm really trying to hit a particular size envelope, mm-hmm. then CoreRT will will definitely be better for helping me do that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, now on the performance, I assume you're talking about startup. That's correct. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, is the benefit of CoreRT significant above um, CoreCLR plus, plus CrossGen? I think we, yeah. it's much easier if we compare from the UW points because at UWP uh, we have already data gathering and on the, uh, you know, the non-UWP scenario we don't have the enough backup data to do aggregation statements. Got it. In UWP scenario, we are seeing about 30 to 50 percent of mm. uh, startup wins with uh, Dynamic Native. And we believe it is transferable because it's not just one application, it's a backup application that we look at. Another important fact to look at it is actually uh, our performance architect mentioned that in UWP app startup, a lot of time was actually spending on XAML. So the differences of the runtime startup may be greater than what we see in UWP scenario when we take it out to a console application. But again, it's really too early and too premature to draw any conclusion from the, you know, conservation. Right, but with that particular investigation, yes. I, I actually don't know anything about it, but I'm just guessing mm-hmm. that, um, like, was that an apples to apples comparison where the um, UWP app was cross-genned to make to... It was n Oh, it was? Yes. Okay, so it was... Yes. Uh, yeah, so it was apples to apples. Yes. But, okay. n- you know, it, it's kind of, there are a lot of, you know, details, you know, yeah. that, uh, for example, like uh, the UWP apps, depend on a lot of the Vinati interop, but uh, that is kind of expensive to do. That, that, that's more expensive in Corsilla than it's, it's in, in the pre-compiled well. environment, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so a lot of it depends on kind of what exactly the app is doing. And I, I, I believe that there's like uh, some, you know, kind of section of the apps that, you know, benefit that would benefit like 10x, you know. Uh, then there, there are like the section of the apps that, you know, it may be kind of wash. And then there may be a section of the apps that where the uh, full pre-compilation might actually hurt them, you know, when right. uh, so if the apps depend on kind of a lot of the dynamic code generation and uh, those kind of thing, those kind of constructs that have to be basically interpreted or executed less efficiently in the fully pre-compiled world, right? They can become slower. Right. Um, so to a degree, it depends. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, is that your last right? question? Th- that, that was the, that, yeah, that was my last question that I had in my head.
Okay, well, yeah, unless you have something that you, you want to announce. Or yeah, any announcements? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any announcement? Um, I know too, mm -hmm. I don't think so. Don't feel well, that you have uh, to. You know, like... Uh, Tony, to a comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes, that's a good Isn't one. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when is that? November? Uh, 16th. Okay, yes, you so. got a time right then. Date right, right? Okay, I November 16th, two into a connect. If, and if I'm wrong, I will put a... a and it's a Bertrand's fault. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, everything is my fault. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, guys. That Thank was very so interesting. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we should have had you guys on the show earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. I accept the apology. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As, as yeah. always. Yes. Uh, and thank you, thank you Kendra. Yes. Yeah, Kendra, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been here the whole time. Yes. <laughs> Sorry yeah. that the audio was a little low in the beginning. My bad. <laughs> uh, it's okay. You're doing great. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you again for being here every week and making the show actually work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Yeah. And Thank thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, we'll be back next week. I don't know who the guest will be next week. Not me. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye.